We make a lot of choices in our lives. Many times a lot more choices than we're aware of. That's what the Buddha is doing when he's inviting you to practice the Dharma, is to be more conscious of your choices so you can make more intelligent ones. To stop focusing on things that you can't change and to focus on the things that you can. Like right now, you have the choice to focus on just about anything at all. No responsibilities, nobody's yelling at you that you've got a deadline. Nobody else is demanding attention. Your body's healthy enough that you can practice, so you have the choice. What do you want to do with the next hour? You could spend the next hour thinking about all kinds of things, thinking about the past, thinking about the future. But if you really want to understand the choices of the mind, you've got to focus on the present moment. So we focus on the breath, because that's one thing that you really do have a lot of leeway in. It may not seem like much, but you can choose to breathe. Short breaths, long breaths, deep breaths, shallow breaths. You can choose to focus on any part of the body at all to be aware of the breath. Because the breath is like the electrical si signals in your brain. They say they can hook up little electrodes to your body at any point and pick up the electrical signals of the brain, even if it's hooked up to your little toes. Maybe weaker down there, but they can still get the signals. That's the same with the breath. There's breath energy throughout the body, so you can focus anywhere. You have the choice. And this is important in two ways. One is you can actually start using your freedom to choose right here to make a comfortable place to stay. Notice which kind of breathing feels good, which kind of breathing doesn't feel good. and keep nudging it towards the more comfortable kind, and then nudging it for greater and greater and more and more subtle levels of pleasure. The one thing you have to watch out for here is when this starts getting really comfortable, you can tend to drift off. As oftentimes as meditators, we're like peasants who don't understand a monthly wage. They get their first payment and they quit the job and <coughs> run through all their money. Then they go back and try to start up and find another job. You stay with the breath for a while and it gets comfortable, and then you bliss out on the sense of comfort. You lose your, your bearings. And then when it crashes, you come back looking for the breath. It's better to keep on working and enjoy the wages continually, because they build up. That's a choice you have. So you choose the way you focus, the things you focus on, adjusting the things you focus on, to develop greater and greater levels of stillness, serenity, tranquility in the present moment. They give the mind the rest that it needs. They give it the nourishment it needs. And at the same time, you become more and more sensitive to this quality of choice, what you're doing in the present moment. Because it's not just what you focus on, it's how you focus, what you're creating through your focus. There's a lot to be learned there. We create worlds for ourselves. That's what becoming is. Both the mental worlds, the imaginary worlds where you picture things, and also states of mind. The things you picture to yourself, those can be sensual becoming. You picture sights, smells, sounds, tastes, tactile sensations you'd like or don't like. Usually we focus on the things we like, but sometimes we look to like to focus on things that really get us worked up, 
and upset. That's our choice. And then you have to ask yourself, where does that take you? If you can drop that, you can work on what's called form becoming. As you create the sense of, explore the sense of the body in the present moment, what you're, how you're experiencing the body right now. Sensations of warmth, solidity, coolness, movement. These make up the body. And if you focus exclusively in terms of these things, you create a different kind of world for yourself. A word, world where your attention fills the present moment. Or you can go on to the formless states, sometimes when the breath gets really, really still, so it seems like you're not breathing at all, there's just oxygen exchange at the skin. The sense of the body gets so fine that it's almost like little dots, and you begin to notice the space between the little dots, and you can focus on that and begin to realize that it's endless. It stretches out in all directions. That's called formless becoming. So right here you see you can create different experiences of the world out of the raw material that you've got. The raw material comes from your past actions. What you're doing with it right now is important. It actually shapes what you're going to experience. And you can see the process as you do it. We not only create our sense of the world, we also create our sense of selves. If you really want to understand the Buddha's teachings on self and not self, pay attention to one word he uses a lot of times. It's I-making and my-making. You make your sense of yourself, you make your sense of what belongs to you. These again are choices that you make. And you can learn to make a skillful eye, or you can like make all kinds of unskillful ones. And you find that you're actually changing your sense of self th over time. It's not solid, it's not static. It moves around, sometimes quite erratically. You may be sailing along with no clearly formed sense of self, and all of a sudden somebody does something really nasty to you that you didn't deserve, and a very strong sense of the injured self. Psychologists have noticed that our sense of injured innocence is where our sense of self gets really strongest. Or you can have a sense of self that doesn't care about the future, only worries about what gratification you're going to get right now. Doesn't care about how you deal with other people, how you treat other people, you just want what you want right now. That's a very unskillful sense of self. And you may look at it and start getting tired of it and say, I prefer a teaching that there is no self. Well, that's unskillful too. You first have to learn how to make a skillful sense of self before you can take it apart skillfully and not in a neurotic or aversive way. You train yourself to look at what true happiness means, what it's going to require. May require some sacrifices in the present moment. It may require that you take other people's desires into account. Because after all, lasting, lasting happiness depends on very specific circumstances that don't just come floating around or can't be forced immediately into place. You have to learn how to be generous. You have to learn how to be principled in your actions. You have to learn how to develop good qualities in the mind for the really deep sense of well-being that comes when you have mastered these things. That requires a sense of self that's willing to put an effort into things, put an effort into the practice, and at the same time taking other people's wishes into account as well. The Buddha said, when you realize that everybody is working towards happiness, you can't base your happiness on something that's going to create suffering for other people, because they're going to be working against your happiness. You may be able to fend them off for a while, but eventually that kind of happiness is going to have to get destroyed. So you want happiness that doesn't place burdens on other people. 
So you have to look more and more deeply. How can you do that? Because after all, you've got this body that needs to be fed, clothed, sheltered, needs medicine. And that creates burdens both for yourself and for other people. So you look inward to see if there's a state of happiness that doesn't depend on the body. And it's in that process that you begin to understand the, the workings of fabrication in the present moment even more deeply. They would have said that there are three kinds of fabrication that come out of ignorance. There's bodily fabrication, verbal, mental. Bodily fabrication is the breath. Verbal is directed thought and evaluation like we're doing right now. You're directing our thoughts to the breath and we're evaluating the breath. There's mental fabrication, it's feelings and perceptions. As you're meditating, you've got all these forms of fabrication right here. As you're creating this state of form becoming. That's the best one for seeing the process of fabrication, because everything is present right here. And as you're doing this, you begin to see that even creating a very nice, stable form of happiness like this, which doesn't ask anything more that you're sitting here and you've got a body and you're breathing, even that can be stressful. And that's where the teaching on not-self comes in. You learn how to let go even of this form of becoming, this form of I-making and my-making. You see that the raw materials from which you're creating this sense of self, form, feelings, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness, they're all impermanent. It's like sand sifting through your fingers. You try to grab onto a fistful of sand and it just runs out through your fingers. So at this point, your strategy of creating a skillful self becomes counterproductive. And the next strategy is to take that self apart, or a sense of self apart. Again, it's an activity. Remember, as the Buddha points out, so many things that we experience in life are things that we do, things that we create. They're strategies for happiness. The self can be a strategy for happiness up to a point. And then the teaching on that self is a strategy that teaches you to look for something even more solid that doesn't create a burden for anybody at all. And it's in the process of that strategy that you discover a totally radically different kind of happiness. And happiness is not conditioned. Now you can find that only by exercising your power of choice, beginning simply from the simple desire you want to find happiness that won't turn on you. You want to find happiness that doesn't create burdens for other people. And then you pursue that. one particular choice, and you don't give up on it. See how far it takes you. It will require different strategies along the way. But they're simply strategies in pursuing that particular choice with greater finesse, with greater skill. And to finally get to that point where there is no fabrication. You step beyond choices, and it's a freedom not of simply surrendering yourself to causal processes. It's a freedom that comes when you escape from causal processes, and choice is no longer an issue. So try to sensitize yourself throughout your life to the choices you're making and realize that your happiness depends on making skillful choices, a process that you can learn. If your life has been unskillful up to this point, that you've got lots of burdens and things in your life, well, you can make choices 
to deal with those burdens skillfully. You can make the choice to change your habits. That's the good part of this process of fabrication, is that it, nothing is ever engraved in stone, because even the stone washes away, disintegrates. Because there is this pr constant process of fabrication, you can focus on the present moment. You don't have to worry about first causes or what happened way back in the past. Just notice what you're doing right now. How are you reacting to the raw material of life? You learn to do it more and more skillfully. And you find that it can take you a lot further than you might imagine.